we may do a declaration as we traditionally do at the end, whether we do or not. This is the last Sunday of the year for your giving and contributions. And by way of information on our exits, there are little black boxes, holy unto the Lord, for your giving, your tithes, your offerings, your alms, uh, donations to the Elkins family, uh, building fund, all of those things. The envelopes in front of you will, will mark. And if you're a guest with us, if you'll fill out one of those cards in front of you, you can keep the ink pen for free and return that card to the Hay Loft. We just thought that was a good name for the place where people connect and all of that good stuff. So that's what we have back there. We have a hay loft for your information and connection and some friendly people back there in the hay loft aprons. We're going to talk about love a little bit today. What love Paula and I have received We've been on the receiving end of great love over the last couple of weeks as you just show up here with cards, nice notes and letters, food. We don't have to go to lunch during the Christmas season because it's on our front row seat. There's all these awesome breads and treats and Homemade. Shh. Oh my goodness. Have y'all ever? Have you ever had Larry Matheny's candy? Woo. Oh my word. A lot of gifts, beautiful things that we can share in our home and. Cards with money in them, gift cards to our favorite picture restaurants, cards, checks in the cards, mail, pictures. Picture cards. People she loves them. them picture cards. You think she likes picture cards? If you want to get on her good side, just send her a picture of your babies and your pets and your house, and she'll love you forever. But mainly, it reminds us that you pray for us and that you think of us, and that you love us. And that's what it takes for God's church to stay strong and be unified. Amen? Amen. Well, it's time for our children to go to class. And I, it's, it's New Year's Eve, okay? So uh, if we go to midnight, we'll ring in the new year together. So don't worry about the clock. We used to meet on New Year's Eve at 7 o'clock when I was a kid. We'd meet on New Year's Eve, whatever night of the week it was, it didn't matter. We'd meet at 7 o'clock, we'd worship for two or three hours, then we'd eat chicken or something, and then we'd worship two or three more hours and ring in the new year. Um, I don't know, we, we don't do that anymore, Donna. Maybe we're tired or old or, or just lazy, I don't know. But we don't do that, but we... We could, and uh, I hope you ring in the new year tonight, first of all, with a celebration and a hallelujah to the Lord for giving us another year. Amen? This little song, the children could have sung better than we can, but I want us to sing it. You can just worship in your seats. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Sing it out now. Yes, Jesus 
Spanish. Okay, I won't, I won't do Spanish version for this crowd. We'll do that next week. Turn in your Bible to Song of Solomon 6 and 5. I don't have that in the, on the screen, Kim, so don't worry about searching it out. It's in the Passion Translation I'm going to read. Turn your eyes from me. I can't take it anymore. I can't resist the passion of these eyes that I adore. Overpowered by a glance, my ravished heart undone. Held captive by your love, I am truly overcome for your undying devotion to me is the most yielded sacrifice. That's kind of how this service has felt to me so far. And I'm excited about what uh, is coming in the next few moments of us together here with God's Word in front of us. So, I went home as we have done faithfully for 41 years in our family. I went home to Mississippi. It's a foreign country down south of Tennessee <laughs> along the Mississippi River, third world country. Not really, but enjoy the fellowship, the family, the being in touch with my, my loved ones. And I got to see some cousins that I hadn't seen in many, many years. Some who live in California and different parts of the country, Texas and faraway places. We don't always come together anymore. Our grandparents have gone on and we've got our own lives and we are grandparents now. So it was neat to be together. I'm the oldest one of all that clan, and there's a bunch of them, but it was so fun to, to see them and their lives going forward and the ministries that they have and all those things. And I was blessed to, to visit and spend some quality time with my mom and my dad, and they're currently both in different facilities trying to navigate these years of their life, this season has them living separately and they get up every morning and either call each other or hitch a ride one over to the other and that sort of thing um, while the rehab and the healing processes are going on. And there's a lot of things that go on as you age and you get older and you realize that physically you're not where you once were and mentally you're not quite as sharp as you once were, and you have to snap your fingers and tap your head to get the computer to reboot sometimes, you know. <laughs> I'll think of that name here in a minute, and um, it's natural. It's a normal process of things, but I could tell my mom is just really frustrated. She said, I'm, I'm really happy in the, the home, the facility. She said, I love it. It's so nice, and they're so nice to me, and it's you know, I don't have to worry about cooking and cleaning and all those things. But she said, I, I, I'm happy here. But I could tell that she wasn't happy with a part of her life. And it, as we dug in and I prayed with her and we began to talk, it came to me that my mom's love language has always been service. If she could make you a sandwich... That was her love language. She was happy. If she could 
pour you a glass of her homemade that much sugar iced tea, she was happy. If it made you smile and lick your lips, she was a happy person. So her love that she, the way she gave her love and showed her love was through service. My mom was actually a Martha in the New Testament sense. She was always busy, always working, sewing, cleaning, cooking, serving, going. Matter of fact, this, she broke her second hip at 86 years old, putting together a yard sale. And she wasn't afraid of work. But that time has come where she is unable to walk without a wheelchair or a walker now, and she realizes that the way she loved must change. She probably won't make another sandwich for anybody or bake a cake or make a meal for anyone. That's probably the reality of it. She served my dad for 65 years as a wife. Amen. Praise God. And really, she just that's the way she loves him. And now, he needs things that she can't provide. So all that love has been kind of piling up and built up in her. And as we begin to minister to that and explain that, she just wept. And I said, Mom, you're gonna, God's going to give you a new love language. Your love language has been service, hands and feet, and Martha ministry. Now God's going to give you a different ministry, a different language of love. And so as I pondered that and, and walked that out, I thought, today, what if we all just thought about our love languages? They're all different. And if you read Gary Chapman, you, you know that he spells out five love languages. And most of us don't, you know, fit into a narrow slot of that. We overlap. Um, you may... You know, your love language might be gift giving or touch or, or whatever words of affirmation. And, and that's not the only love you give and receive, but it might be your primary one and you can overlap into other areas of giving your love. But if you're in a place in your life where you've got a lot of love that has no place to go, that could be defined as grief. Or grief could be defined as love with no place to go. When you lose a loved one that you've loved and loved and served and given to, and they're gone to their heavenly reward, and all that love is still in there, and you've got to find a way to make it land somewhere. You've got to find an outlet for that because we weren't designed to be vessels as in holding tanks we weren't designed to be cisterns of God's love. We were designed to be conduits through which that love flows. The happiest people in the world are the people whose outflow of their conduit is as large as their inflow. Matter of fact, Paul says in the New Testament, there is a manifold. That means it comes in one way and goes out many ways. That's what needs to happen with all of us. We may receive love in a particular way better than others, but when it goes out from us, it ought to multiply. The multiplied grace, the multiplied love, the manifold grace, the manifold love. So I want to, as we enter into this new year and close out 23, I think the greatest thing we could talk about is the love of God and how we are conduits and we manifest that. 1 John 4 is one of my favorite places to, to quote and to read and to meditate on. And it says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. 
He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know that the spirit of truth, uh, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not know God, for God, who does not love, does not know God, for God is love. Now, most of us in this room have had a moment in our life where we came to the realization of that, where that awakening happened. The light came on, and we realized, oh. oh Ah, might have been when you were baptized. might have been when you repented. It might have been when you received a, a, a gift. Maybe when you had a baby. I don't know. But some point in your life, you understood that God is love. And you have to realize that most of the world does not know what you know. There's people that you walk by. And say hi to coming and going in your day that have no idea that God is love. But it's up to us to open that door, to open their heart, and God's going to show us how to do that. One of the first things we have to learn to do is be loved by God. God's not mad at you. God's not just wanting to straighten out your mess and, and punish you for your wrong and your mistakes and your errors. He's, he's, not a, he's not just up there checking boxes so he knows which punishment to put on you next. He's not just a judge that's banging the gavel every, all day long, sh shaming you. No, no, no. God loves you. There's a pop singer and a Christian singer back in the 70s and 80s named B.J. Thomas. And he made it real big in the music field, and I used to really enjoy his music. And he sang a song. It said, I need to be still and let God love me. I need to be still and let God love me. When this old world tries to push and shove me. I just need to be still and let God love me. I, I think we need to be still sometimes. In our, in our 21 days of fasting, if you don't do anything else, get still enough that God can love you. The first mention of love in the Bible is in Genesis 22, which is also the first mention of worship. Not a coincidence that those go hand in hand, worship and love, love and worship. But it's in Genesis 22 and 2, he said, Now take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. God knew how to get to Abraham it was through his son whom he loved. A very close parallel to God's love for Jesus and God's love for us in offering up his son. Jesus pointed out in Matthew 22 that love is the most important thing. He made it the priority. If you're not going to do anything else, there's two commandments that you must keep because on these two hang everything. Listen, verse 37, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You tell me a commandment that you can break out of the other eight. 
if you really love God and you really love your neighbor? It's impossible. You can't steal from your neighbor if you love your neighbor. You would rather give them something than steal the stuff they worked hard for, right? So really and truly on these two laws hang all of the law and the prophets. And back to 1 John 4, verse 9, it says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is the love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. John 3, 16, most of you can quote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but shall have everlasting life. Amen? <laughs> so Jesus came and he gave love a face. You say, well, Love is just an emotion. No, 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 no. Love is just imagination. It's just a state of mind. No, 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 no. You've, you've got it way wrong. If you want to know what love is, look at the face of Jesus Christ. His visage was marred. We sang about the blood earlier. There's no, no greater picture of love than a man would lay down his life give up his own blood for we sinners. That's love. That's love. I mean, if we work out a car deal between each other and I give you money and you give me a car, that's not love. That's just a trade. But when God gave his life for us on a cross, his only son, and we didn't have really anything to put on the table, that's love. The gifts I give to my wife at Christmas, if she doesn't bring anything to the tree, my gifts are still there. My gifts are love for her. I want her to have those gifts. And by the way, she did give me a lot of gifts. <laughs> but Jesus gave love a face. Look at your neighbor and say, I want to give love a face. See, I preached a message back in the 90s, which makes me sound really old, but I'm not really that old. I was really, really young. <laughs> preached a message about give love a face. And, and I went through the scripture and I pointed out that different things different people give a face to. Cain, in the Bible, in Genesis, gave murder a face. Abraham gave faith a face. If I called out words today, you can picture somebody in your mind connected to that word. A thief, pride, adultery, you know, all the anything you name, somebody in your world has given it a face. Good or bad. Kindness. You're picturing somebody when, when you hear the word kindness. And most of us in this room don't have to look around very far to see a face that is the picture of kindness. If I said hard work, somebody comes to your mind, your dad, your uncle, your brother, your, yourself maybe, I don't know. Hard work, give it a face. The gospel of love is looking for a face. The world is looking to your face to see the gospel of God's love for them. 1 John 4, 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That word if is just kind of in there, but there's no if about it. He did love us, and there should be no if in how we love and who we love. And 
if you're in Christ and Christ is in you, you really and truly love everybody. And Paula and I were having a conversation yesterday. And I said, you know, if you love everybody, it'll cost you some relationships because some people don't want you to love everybody. Some people want you to hate the people they hate or they can't get along with you. You're okay to lose those friends. Love them, but let them go. Because if you are in Christ and Christ is in you and you give love a face, you will love every body. Oh, but Pastor Paul, you don't understand. You are exactly right. I do not understand. If I understood that and understood you, I would get a pay raise. But I don't understand, but I know one who does. And I know from experience, you can love them that despitefully use you. You can love them that take you to court. You can love them that hate you. You can love them that persecute you. Stephen was stoned saying, Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge. Now, he wasn't about to get up and start hugging all of them. He wasn't about to take them on vacation next week or anything like that. But he loved them with a God love, and he didn't want bad or harm to happen to them. God can do that in your heart if you'll let him. Love will do that. Love is powerful. In 21 days, I'm going to ask you to give love intentionally through prayer for one another. So we're going to just put a real practical application on this thing. You've got 21 slots on the front of your card where love will go out from you through your phone. You say, hey, I'm fasting 21 days. You're part of the people I love and people I want to minister to, can I pray for you real quick? All right? Now, those of you that don't answer your phone, during this 21 days, please answer your phone. Turn the ringer on, turn it up high, and answer it. It wouldn't hurt us to change our voice mail response message on there to say I'm busy right now but if you called to pray for me go ahead and pray I like that I think how many of you would do that just for 21 days I'm busy right now I can't take your call but if you're praying for me please go ahead and pray right now Ding. let her rip amen and I will call you back and say amen The power of love. Love can drive out oppression, depression, grief, strife. Power of love. Power of love. Somebody you're not sure really likes you, love on them. Show them some love. Show them some real love. And watch God open that up. Wow. There's a lot of love in there. It just kind of gets hidden, doesn't it? In the late part of the last century, Lee Searle, it's a name I haven't heard, the daughter of the famous genius donated 1,400 letters written by her father, Albert Einstein, to the Hebrew University with orders not to publish their comments until two decades after his death. This is one of those letters by Einstein. Some would say the foremost scientist. When I proposed the theory of relativity, very few understood me. And what I will reveal now, to 
to transmit to mankind will also collide with misunderstanding and prejudice that abides in our world. I ask you to guard the letters as long as necessary, years, decades even, until society is advanced enough to accept what I will explain in the letter below. There is an extremely powerful force that so far science has not found a formal explanation to. It is a force that includes and governs all others and is even behind any phenomenon operating in the universe and has not yet been identified by us. This universal force is love. When scientists looked for a unified theory of the universe, they forgot the most powerful unseen force. Love is light that enlightens those who give and receive it. Love is gravity because it makes some people feel attracted to others. Love is power because it multiplies the best we have and allows humanity not to be extinguished in their blind selfishness. Love unfolds and reveals. For love we live and die. Love is God. And God is love. Now we've read that in the Bible. I don't know if Einstein read it or if it was just revealed to him. This force explains everything and gives meaning to life. This is the variable that we have ignored for too long. Maybe because we're afraid of love, because it is the only energy in the universe that man has not learned to drive at will. To give visibility to love, I made a simple substitution in my most famous equation. If instead of E equal MC square, we accept that the energy to heal the world can be obtained through love multiplied by the speed of light squared. We arrive at the conclusion that love is the most powerful force there is because it has no limits. After the failure of humanity in the use and control of other forces in the universe that have turned against us, it is urgent that we nourish ourselves with another kind of energy. If we want our species to survive, if we are to find meaning in life, if we are to save the world and every sentient being that inhabits it, love is the only answer. Perhaps we are not yet ready to make a bomb of love, a device powerful enough to entirely destroy the hate, the selfishness, and greed that devastate the planet. However, each individual carries within them a small but powerful generator of love whose energy is waiting to be released. When we learn to give and receive this universal energy, dear Lisa, we will have affirmed that love conquers all, is able to transcend everything and anything. Because love is the quintessence of life. I deeply regret not having been able to express what is in my heart, which has quietly beaten for you all my life. Maybe it's too late to apologize, but as time is relative, I need to tell you that I love you. And thanks to you, I have reached the ultimate 
answer. Would you stand with me? The word of God is powerful, dividing asunder the soul and the spirit. When God put it on Paula and I in 1995 to step out and form a congregation of believers and open our hearts and open our pocketbook and open our doors to worship, to lead, he made it very clear to us that his theme for us was love. It's not just a catchphrase. We were at a drive through this morning. It said, taste the love. And the world uses that term loosely. But when I was 16 years old, God spoke to me, and I can take you to the place in the church building where I was sitting as a preacher was preaching a message on love. And he told me, you're going to preach the gospel of love. If the river church is characterized by anything, I believe it's love. I believe people that come and visit, they may be frightened by this or that. They may be misunderstand some of our outbursts of praise and different things that we exercise in, but if they don't get anything else, comfortable seats, visitor parking, friendly greeters, if they don't get anything else, let them know God loves and God's church is his vessel, his instrument of love. I say before 24 is over, we could create that bomb of love and that B-O-M-B could turn into a B-A-L-M a balm of love and heal our city, heal our community, heal our brokenness in this community. So here's what I want you to do in a practical how-to application these next 21 days. Pray for a clean heart. Pray for humility. Pray for a Christ-like spirit. And then ask God for direction in how to show his love. Seek out those whom God has prepared for his entrance. When you get an open door, when that name drops in your head, it could mean that God is on the other end of that, working in them. The spirit realm is so tuned up right now. The, the, there's such a keen awareness. I'm telling you, I have picked up my phone and started dialing pastor friends states away. And my phone start ringing. And it's that pastor. This is where we are right now. You expect that to happen in the next 21 days and on, going on. Expect it to happen that you're thinking about somebody and boom, they call you. God wants to knit and connect and root us spiritually deeper than we've ever been. And I love that about this church, that you can call people and they say, oh, I was just praying for you. Coincidence? Out of hundreds of people? No, 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 no. There's a dimension that hasn't been defined. There's a force that cannot go in a formula. But God is releasing that to us. And God is giving us the how-to to set into motion the greatest power 
on planet Earth. So seek out those whom God has prepared for his entrance and you're the tool, you're the door, you're the connection, you're the key to their heart. And then the last thing I think is probably the most important thing I ever learned about spiritual activity is to act without hesitation. When an amen gets right up here on the tip of your tongue, let it out. When a hallelujah comes bubbling up in you, go ahead and hallelujah. When a hug is just all piled up in your arms, give it. Turn that frown upside down. Act without hesitation. Give, serve, love, call, text, write, email, fast, pray, pray some more, share some scripture, share whatever it is that God has put on your heart, a testimony. When you're writing down your prayer needs, I want to see the praise side of the page greater than the prayer requests petition side of the page. I want to see our two glass jars that we have for prayer requests and praise reports, the praise report side full. Amen? Because I'll guarantee you, you can list your needs as long as the paper will hold. But you'll run out of legal pads real quick when you really take the time to count your blessings. When you really think about all the many, many, many things, the Bible says, remember, forget not all his benefits. Let's pray. Father, saturate us with your love. Shake us from our complacency. Move us out of our pride and ego and selfishness and let us see that it's not for us that we live, it's for you. It's not about me, it's about you. It's about the Christ in my neighbor, the Christ in the church, the Christ in the person in front of me, behind me, beside me. Christ in the person that doesn't look like me, act like me, live like me, talk like me. The person I don't understand. Yes, and even the person I don't really like. God, show us how to love the way you love. Help us to become like little children who will hug anybody. Teach us to love in a new meaning of love. Teach us the power of love. God, I want to be more like you. The essence of my relationship with you must be that I become like you and that everything you intend to do in the earth, I am participating in every day, every way. Help me, God. Help me, God. Help me, God. Now just reach over and Touch someone, take them by the hand, touch them on the shoulder, make a connection, and pray for the people you're touching. Just call their name if you know their name. If you don't, take a minute and ask them. What's your name? I want to pray for you. Pray for one another. This is what the Bible says to do. Pray for one another. I'm loving you, Jesus. Oh, you gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. That's it. Oh, how he loves me.
I'm going to stretch us a little bit. I want you to move away from your spouse, your family member. Find someone different and look them right in the eyes. Go. Move. Find someone different from your spouse and look them right in the eye. Now sing this to them. He really loves you. He really loves you. I really love you. I really love you.
JAGA